I appreciate the good music. Before we go to uh, Bible study this evening, uh, I just want to share something that caught my eye that I thought was uh, noteworthy, especially here in Bible study uh, here Tuesday evening. But on Fox News, uh, they had a, a statement uh, on their, their internet news there that was uh, quite encouraging, and uh, I appreciated seeing it. But this year, uh, the, uh, that Bible that you hold in your hand, the King James Version of the Bible, is celebrating its 400th birthday. Wow. Praise God. Amen. And uh, they had some good things to say. They said the poetic power of the King James Bible is part of our heritage. Around the world, people have been comforted by the words, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They have been challenged by be strong and of good courage. Uh, they have celebrated with the proclamation, Fear not, for born unto you this day in the city of David, uh, amen, is a Savior, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. And uh, as I begin to uh, look and read a little bit further, I uh, was encouraged as I seen the, the difficulty that it was 400 years ago for William Tyndale to be able to translate this Bible. And uh, when we look at the King James Version, I know that information is, is just multiplying so rapidly uh, with, with the internet system, with, with, with the net generation. Uh, information is, is multiplying extravagantly, and it's impressive to think about. But at this time, 400 years ago, it took uh, Tyndale, and, and, and with him, there were 44 scholars, and it took them seven years to translate this Bible that we now use on a daily basis. Amen. And, uh, I, I, and when we look at it, uh, it was within... Uh, uh, the year of uh, 1611, within 50 years, it dominated the English translation of the Bible, and it's held that position for over 300 years. Wow! It was at a time in which you know there was a separation. Uh, there, were, there was a, the, the the Roman Catholic Church uh, was having difficulties, and so Tyndale requested that the Bible be translated into a language that the people can understand. It is the number one bestseller, even still today. Uh, it's it's uh, been a, it's been in print continuously for 400 years. Amen. It has not only been in print, but it has helped form our English language that we know today. Amen. And so I appreciate the Bible, don't you? Amen. God's holy word. Amen. Praise God. 400 years. Amen. That we've had this translation of the Bible. And uh, God is faithful. Turn with me tonight to the book of Micah. Micah chapter number 7, and we're going to look at verse number 7 this evening. Someone read Micah 7, 7. Therefore, I look unto the Lord, I will wait for the, for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Read on down to verse number 8, actually, as well, too, brother. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be my light, shall be enlightened to me. Amen. I want to look at this thought tonight. When you can't, when you can't, get out. Amen. Uh, the prophet writes and he says that he'll look unto the Lord. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, he said, the Lord will be a light unto me. I read an interesting story and uh, uh, just several fascinating facts. And I'd like to share that story with you. And then I'd like to share uh, some concepts from that, from the Word of God, that I think will be good to, for you this evening. 
I, I was reading and I found that during the Second World War, uh, it was in Koditz uh, uh, Castle in Germany that there was a, a, a prison that was there that was supposed to be the Nazis' most escape pr proof prison. And here at this prison, uh, all the other prisoners of war, war uh, if they had tried to uh, escape and they were caught, they were sent here uh, to this prison castle in Koditz, Germany. And uh, it was here in this concentration camp that it was amazing that there was such high security. Now, how could there be such uh, high-tech security at a time like that? It was a prison where there was actually more prison guards than there were prisoners, Brother Doug. Uh, pretty amazing to think about. So that was pretty high-tech when there wasn't surveillance cameras and a lot of other things. And uh, during the time that uh, the castle was in operation uh, and its uh, security, it is said that there was uh, many who were confined here and uh, they would do their best to, uh, to still try to escape from this castle prison. And there was more than 300 would-be escapers who would be caught in the act. And uh, they would keep trying and trying again to escape to become uh, a, a, an individual of freedom where they were no longer a prisoner. There was 130 occasions, Brother Layman, that is recorded where there would be prisoners who would try to escape. Now, on, uh, on 130 of these occasions, uh, there, there was, uh, I'm sorry, there would be 300 that would try to escape, 130 that would get outside the prisoner, and there would only be 30 escapees who would have success in escaping from the confines of this prison. But in the middle of this prison, there was a security guard, and his name was Reinhold Eggers. And Reinhold Eggers did something that was amazing during his time. He actually did something that would turn that prison into a museum. He would take pictures of the prisoners and their methods of trying to escape, and he would compile it together, and it was found in a book uh, a little later that, would, that was very meticulous about the record keeping of these prisoners that tried to escape. I'd like to share some of them with you this evening. They're almost humorous and, and uh, uh, very interesting. Lieutenant Peter Allen, he tried to escape the prison by doing this when some mattresses were being carried out, straw mattresses, he and some of his fellow individuals devised a scheme that they were going to crawl inside of the mattresses. And as they were carried out and they were taken away, that would be their escape route out. It was very successful until one of the guards dropped one of the mattresses and stepped on it. And his cohort, uh, certainly uh, was one that uh, shared the news that they were trying to escape through the mattresses. So they were taken back in. And there was Lieutenant uh, uh, Schmickel who tried to escape by tying sheets together from the attic and he tried to climb down the castle. The unfortunate thing that gave him away was there was nails in his shoe that would rub against the, the, the rocks of the wall and the, prison, uh, the guards heard it, seen him, and took him captive and took him back in. Another prisoner, prison, pris, uh, uh, prisoner uh, French Lieutenant Bowley, he disguised himself as a woman and he wasn't even discovered until he dropped his pocket watch and they returned it to him and uh, thinking that it was a her and it was discovered that he was a prisoner and uh, they took him back in. And there was another group of prisoners that decided that they were going to escape through a route in which uh, they had devised so very well in which they were going to climb out through some drain uh, piping. And as they drew, uh, climbed out to the drain piping, they almost were successful. But when they came out, there was a group of, uh, 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 of soldiers uh, uh, standing there. And when they walked out, they spotted them and they took them back in. There were some others who tried to escape through a hole in the laboratory, uh, but scratching noises were heard. They were taken back in. 
There was one man who escaped to a crate that was the Red Crosses. He climbed inside, but he was brought back in. And there were many immaculate schemes that, that were attempted here at Colt's Castle, uh, but unfortunately, there was none that was successful. One of the greatest uh, uh, engineering schemes was that behind a fake high wall, there the prisoners decided that they were going to take shutters and other pieces of equipment, and they actually tried to devise something that they could use to actually get in and kind of sail out of there and, and fly out, if you would. But the war was over before they could ever use it. The unfortunate part about all these prisoners of war who tried to escape, they come back into the prison and they face something that would last for days and sometimes weeks as they face solitary confinement. And there was nothing that must have been more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, hopeless uh, to them and their feelings than to be taken back into this, this cell block and, and being put there into confines. But as I was thinking about this, there are many people in their life who feel the same way. Held back in fines. Held captive. Hoping to escape. Don't be taken back in and be held captive again. And there are some that they're in a dungeon of depression. Maybe some in a jailhouse of jealousy. And there are some who are in a cell block of sickness. And there are some that are in a detention center of discouragement or maybe in a prison of pain. But I'd like to look at the Word of God this evening. I'd like to look at some individuals who found themselves at a place where they probably wished that they could escape, but it just didn't seem like they could get out. And so what to do to get out is what I want to look at this evening. The very first individual that I want to look at this evening uh, is found in the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 4. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 4. When someone has that, if you read it, then someone else look up Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3, verse 21 through 23. Jonah 2, 4. Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. I'm going to try to be tonight uh, somewhat, uh, I guess, uh, using a, uh, uh, a system that will hopefully, uh, when your mind begins to think, that you can use these letters of R and uh, think about them. And uh, the very first thing that I want to say as we look at the first candidate is if you're in the belly of the whale, Jonah, choose to repent. Sometimes people find themselves in a prison. Sometimes they find themselves in a place where they're out captive because they simply need to do one thing. They need to repent. And so, someone read Jonah 2 4. Someone have that? Jonah 2 4. Then I said, I am passed out of my sight, yet I will look again toward my holy people. Here Jonah is, and he's in the belly of the whale. And uh, the big fish, however you want to look at it. And uh, as he's here, he says, I realize that I'm outside. He was trapped, wasn't he? He was at a place where there was no escape. He wanted to do things his own way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Jonah is any different than the majority of us. We like to do things our own way. And sometimes we even want to do things for God, but we want to do them for God with our stipulation on them. Mm -hmm. God, please don't send me there. God, don't have me do that. I will do this instead. But when we find ourselves dictating our life and, and dictating our schedule and making up our own syllabus, we'll find that God will be still there desiring to lead us in the right direction. And we'll find that oftentimes that we wind up in the belly of the big fish, we find ourselves being a captive to our own desires and doing things our own way. So what do we do to get out of that? Well, it's pretty simple, but sometimes it's pretty difficult. Repent. Mm -hmm. Jonah 2, 
Jonah said this. He said, God, I don't see you. I'm not able to even go to the temple. He said, I'm hid away in this dark place. He knew his situation. He knew the storm that had, had been caused. He, he knew that when he was thrown overboard, he knew that God was there. 